Welcome back. In the next five minutes, we'll hopefully, I'll teach you everything you need to know about cohort studies and case control studies. So as an overview, the two main types of studies are experimental and observational. Experimental really includes randomized controlled trials. Whereas in observational studies, in general, you're just observing the participants. You're not actually acting on them, nor are you randomizing them to something. The main types of observational studies are cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional, ecological studies, and an individual case study. Like, hey, here's a case report or a case series. Hey, here's five case reports. But again, we're going to talk about cohort studies and case control studies. Cohort studies are actually pretty simple. They are defined as individuals having a cohort entry event plus they're followed over time. This cohort entry event can be all sorts of things. The most famous example, or one of the most famous examples in the epidemiologic literature is a nurse's health study. So this cohort was a group of nurses aged 30 to 55 uh, in 1976 who were followed forward in time. There's other cohort defining events. Maybe your cohort is individuals with a medical diagnosis. They all have diabetes or they all have COVID-19. Or maybe it's a cohort of individuals who had some surgical procedure or received some medication. There are a few other terms I should probably elucidate. These include exposure, retrospective, and prospective. Exposure is that thing you're interested in studying. So many years ago now, I was interested to know, do SGLT2 inhibitors increase a person's risk of fracture? In that research question, the exposure is SGLT2 inhibitors and the outcome is fracture. And then your studies can be retrospective if at the time you're conducting the study, the individual data has already been accrued, the exposure status is known, the outcomes have already occurred, in contrast to a prospective study where we decide, okay, you know what, let's create a cohort. Let's find individuals who got some drug at a hospital and then let's check in with them every six months or every year to see if they've developed some event of interest. So going back to the study looking at whether or not SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with an increased risk of fracture, we used a database in the U.S. called MarketScan, which included individuals in the U.S. who had health insurance. For us, the cohort was defined as individuals who had type 2 diabetes. And exposure were people who got an SGLT2 uh, in orange here. And the comparator group, or the unexposed, were people who got a DPP-4 inhibitor. They were then followed forward in time to see who had a fracture and who did not. But at the time that I conducted the study in 2016, all of the data had already been accrued and all of the exposure status and whether or not somebody had a fracture or didn't have a fracture, that was all known. As a result, this is retrospective. So again, in a cohort study, you have some cohort entry event uh, and then you identify people who are exposed or unexposed and then see what happens after that. So um, now we're slowly going to move on to case control studies and hopefully this diagram will help once I contrast it to show what a similar study would look like if it were a case control study. So with a case control study, you identify cases, that's people who had the outcome, and then you identify controls, people who did not have the outcome, and then identify the exposure status preceding. So um, going back to this study here, if it were a case control study, we'd identify all the individuals in a database who had a fracture, as well as all the individuals who did not. These are the cases, these are the controls. And then we'd see how often each group got an SGLT2 inhibitor to see if SGLT2 inhibitors are associated with an increased risk of fracture. Here's a table that I hope will allow you to synthesize this information and compare the two. With a case control study, the first step is you're identifying all those with the outcome, the cases, and all those without the controls. In a cohort study, you want to identify all those with that cohort defining event. For example, they all had diabetes. Um, step two in both cases is then identifying uh, of these individuals who was exposed and who was unexposed. 
from a case control study, what does it actually give you? Well, the only outcome you can calculate is an odds ratio. Whereas with a cohort study, you can calculate a risk ratio, a rate ratio, or a hazard ratio. If you're like, what on earth are these? Uh, hopefully soon I'll have a talk to explain what these terms mean. Uh, case control studies are, are said to be more efficient, right? They're more efficient because remember your statistical power in a study is really driven by the number of people who have the events or the outcome of interest. And with a case control study, one of your first step is identifying all those who've had the outcome. Uh, the risk of bias is similar between the two. Um, and then with a case control study, it doesn't give you a sense of the absolute risk of an event, only the relative risk. Whereas with a cohort study, it gives you the absolute risk, uh, which I quite like. And then the main reason why I really pursue cohort studies, I just find it's way easier to explain and understand what's going on with a cohort study in compared uh, to a case control study. Um, my team has uh, created a website called journal.com. Um, so if you're a researcher and you want to make your life a little bit easier when you're finding journals to submit to and what they require, you can check this out. And please leave some reviews on the journals to uh, torch those that waste our time and also highlight those that actually make the submission process quite easy. That's it. I hope you learned something new.